today I'm chatting with Chris McMurray, who's a pastor, author, business coach, and it just really has a lot of really interesting stories. And he's got this book that I just got a hold of called Food Stamps to Franchise, where he goes into a lot of these really fascinating stories. He's got just lived a lot of life. And um, we're gonna be talking about some of that today. But but anyway, Chris, welcome to the Seed Time Money Podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thanks yeah, for the opportunity. I'm, yeah, I'm excited to chat. And I want to start with uh, a story that you've probably told many hundreds of times, but take us back to whatever, probably about 13 years ago, your bakery, something really remarkable happened that probably a lot of people listening might remember. Can you tell us that story? Sure. Yeah. So to back it up just a little bit and give you a little context, I grew up in the home of a serial entrepreneur. So it's been my blood. And those of you that have that same DNA, you understand that constant yearning within start something new and, and contribute yeah and leave that legacy. So really that's a heartbeat. Kelly and I had started a cookie concept that was brand new to the market. What was unique about us is that you could custom order cookies. So we had doughs and mix-ins that you could yeah. select from, create thousands of combinations, and it could be your own design. They were hot and fresh in seven minutes for you. So that's amazing. We, uh, re really a unique to the market concept, sort of like a, at the time, like Subway or Cold Stone Creamery. Mm -hmm. So we were there, but we also had developed a little piece of our business that was basically catering, but for events. Mm -hmm. And we had one of our early big events, which was a wedding. And there were cookies that we were making that had monograms and intricate icing, and they all had to be fresh and couldn't really sit on the shelf. And so we had been doing that in our store in Radford, Virginia, and Kelly had actually, we were trading shifts. We had our two little girls at the time and we traded off in the morning. So Kelly had been working overnight. I came in to relieve wow. her in the morning. But what was unique about this day, we, I was driving through town like always. There was a unique quietness, but also some police presence and some other additional presence that I wasn't accustomed to in our little small town. Didn't think anything of it. Came to the back of the store, got right to work. Kelly traded and left. And before opening, we had a lady knock on the door. And I was actually there by myself at the time. And she came in and I've just greeted her and said, Hey, and she told me that she was from Joe Biden, who was then the vice president. They were running for a second term in 2012 Obama Biden ticket. She was representing his advance team. And we all know he loves ice cream. He wanted to pop in. We had ice cream. So he wanted to pop in on his way to an event that was actually at Virginia Tech that yeah. day, which we knew about the event, but we had no idea, no advanced knowledge that he was planning to stop in. And I thought for a little bit, and I just told the lady that I wasn't really interested in being used as a backdrop at the <laughs> time, at the time they were correct, course correcting a little bit because Obama had been also local in, in Roanoke, just down the road from us, just a few weeks prior. And he made this comment that just ran all over us. And, and the comment was, if you have a business, you didn't build that. Mm -hmm. And of course, they I tried to walk that. it. Yeah, they tried to walk it back, say they were saying something different, which wasn't the case. He meant what he said. And, and that immediately, for some reason, came to my mind because I was pretty worked up about it. Here Kelly is. She's been up all night. Yeah. I've traded off with her and probably three or four hours of sleep max. And it's good that we were busy in that sense, but we were working really hard to build something really for our legacy. And that really was the heartbeat behind our crumb and get it concept was the legacy for our kids and for our community and all kinds of things. So anyway, she was very polite, went out, they regrouped, went up the road to another restaurant place and actually if he did go in, it was very brief, but he didn't go in, didn't plan to buy anything, just did some greeting and, and left. But we had a big piece of our business life is built on relationships. I've worked mm -hmm. in the corporate world. We've owned small businesses. I've done real estate development, all kinds of things. And I always bank and count on good, solid, strong relationships. And we had worked to build the relationships down Main Street in Radford. And there was a lady who was two doors down from us that had a wonderful dress shop at the time. And she popped in every morning to get some coffee. And we just had free coffee for people who wanted to pop in or whatever. But we also chatted usually with her a little bit. 
As part of the course of our com regular conversation that morning, I mentioned that event to her, which I didn't know, but she left our store, went down back down to her store, picked up the phone and called a friend who called a news anchor who I got a phone call from just a few minutes later. And uh, the news anchor was there at the shop within a few minutes and it, it recorded um, a little story that would air that evening, lead the evening news. And so the whole story did. And from there, the rest is history. It blew up. National news got it. We were all over every news media outlet you could think of. In the days that followed, I did media appearances and appeared on the campaign trail. And they took that messaging the you didn't build it and countered it in relationship with my story and created a slogan. You did build it was on yeah. t-shirts and across the podium. And we were not prepared for that kind of excitement. It yeah. was a very unusual and unique time. As a result, our social media blew up and we developed international shipping. And it just, it's a whole crazy story beyond that. Yeah. But my, my whole thing is two things. One is if you're ever given the platform, I think it's God given and that we should utilize it in the way that honors him. Yeah. And that was at the forefront. And in some cases that cost me some appearances that cost me some alignment at the time, but I was okay with that because that was my ultimate goal was to represent him well. And the decision of principle is made before you ever get into a situation. It's not made yeah. in the moment. I, yeah. And there's no way I, there were some news anchors that speculated that I had pre-calculated the response, which there was no way we had no prior knowledge. He was even planning to do that much less. I wouldn't have been that smart to yeah. orchestrate something beyond what happened in the moment. And we didn't take it to the news. Yeah. I agreed yeah. to talk with the anchor, but I never dreamed it would become what it would become. Yeah. Uh, but, but the principles decided beforehand. So most of that news coverage nationally, because I remember hearing about it, but I don't watch a lot of news. So for me, it was just a passing headline or something, but most of that news coverage, was it negative towards you? By and large, believe it or not, it was positive. We had a few, and I don't know if it was just like the covering of God in that moment or, yeah. or what. There were there was criticism. I'm, I'm not saying that. And we got a few direct messages on social media, or I had one person, that's the only person we can remember that came into the store to give us what for. All the rest was positive. It ended up in a boycott, and they just sold us out for weeks on end in the store. And it didn't matter if it was on a news media outlet that was not necessarily positive on the story. Every time that I appeared, it was a bump in in revenue, a bump in sales. And all publicity uh, is good publicity. <laughs> it is in a way. And again, I tell people this all the time. I don't know. But by the grace of God, I don't know how I navigated the way that I, with no prior experience, yeah. and it was just a God moment, top to bottom. And I knew that I was representing other people who felt the way that Kelly and I did, mm -hmm. particularly with the statement from Obama, but then also from a faith perspective. Yeah. Okay. So you talked a little bit about, but what other, that's got to be, I don't know if it's a turning point, but a significant milestone in your life, whereas where there's certain lessons that you learned in that, that you will carry for the rest of your life. Are there any that come to mind? I think most notably is the depths from which we came. We, the book talks about how we struggled in the early years of uh, developing yeah. a business. And actually I had ventured out on all kinds of things that I, I thought were great ideas, or in some cases felt like it was the leadership of God, but had fizzled and not gone so well and mm -hmm. left us in places at times with boatloads of debt or no real path forward. And we had accepted assistance, food stamps for a period in our life. And I just remember being so humi humiliated that I couldn't, through my own ability, which I felt like I had some, sort of pull our family out of that. And the success of our business finally gave us the freedom to make that phone call and not be in those depths anymore. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's what resonates because I think there are people, a lot of people like us, Kelly and I, 
that have experienced the pains of that depth and maybe they're hiding yeah. from that story. And this story, it's part, it reads partly as our story. Um, there's some faith-based principles in there. And then there's some action items or business insights in every chapter. And through our story, our hope is, my hope is that people wouldn't experience the depth of that pain. They might be able to avoid some of those tripping hazards along the way. Yeah. And, and so that, for me, that's probably the most notable memory coming out of that, going from the depth yeah. to the mountaintop in a very short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. So summing up, I wasn't able to finish the book, but I was able to make it through, I don't know, maybe half or so. And let me just ask you this. If you had to break down some of the significant tough choices that you've made in your life that have helped you become who you are now and or transition from what you're talking about here with the food stamps to the whatever, the higher point, the mountaintop. What would be some of those significant turning point choices for you? I think for one, a clearly defined why. Mm. Why am That's I good. doing this? Why am I pursuing this? And and how does that fit into my God-given calling? Because I've missed that a, a few times yeah. in my life, and admittedly. and But really digging in on, am I meeting a direct need or a question that already exists? And then when you get in the moment, you have to stick to that why when it feels shaky. And having that defined so clearly up front, it changed my whole perspective. And that was a piece that propelled our success is that I just came back to the why. One of the great things and challenges with being in business <laughs> is that everyone suggests something to you, right? What you mm -hmm. should be doing what yep. you could be doing better, or I did it this way or whatever. We hear that yeah. kind of stuff all the time. And I, early on, I followed a lot of that and it led us down some stupid holes mm -hmm. and everybody's path is different. Everybody's uh, idea is nuanced. Their why should be different. Not just, Hey, I'm a great cook. Maybe I should open a restaurant. No, define mm -hmm. the why that you're answering within your community or even your personal why is it for the legacy for your kids and our whole defining success, which is discussed quite a bit in the book, defining success, I think is challenging for people because most people associate that with money in the bank, car in the garage, mm -hmm. neighborhood you live in, whatever. And we never define success that way. I always define success by how much am I able to give mm -hmm. and giving in the place and that's when we go back to the why, that's what propelled me to achieve more or to grow the business and kept us focused on maybe we weren't going to do vacation this year or make those choices in the way that we would in terms of spending it on the business rather than spending it personally as an example. But it all circled back to that why. And I think another critical decision is I didn't always surround myself, haven't ever, uh, surrounded myself with people who just affirm the path that I'm on. But I instead seek out people who are going to be honest with me while cultivating my creative side. Because for those of us that are creatives, we understand that if we have this great idea, it's personal for us. So when you criticize the idea, like sometimes it feels a little personal, does for me anyway. But you can't surround yourself with people who are always just affirming that. You have to have that push, that resistance. I heard a great analogy and I wish I could give the person credit because it's so good, but talking about an airplane needs resistance to become airborne. Mm -hmm. So you need the headwind and the tailwind. You need both for it to be effective. You can't just have the push behind you. It's ineffective. It'll stay on the ground. Yeah. That's in terms of critical decision points, defining my why and surrounding myself with people that have a willingness to be honest with me while not crushing that, that. Yeah. yeah, that's good. So I'm going to hop around and bounce around a little bit, but I'm just curious based on some of the things you're saying, what are, what would you say are some of the books that have influenced you most over the years? And again, propelled you forward in one way or another. 
I have an interesting one and people will have their opinions, but I've applied it in a church setting, nonprofit setting, and in business setting. But Lee Cockrell wrote a book who's a famous leader at Walt Disney World, now retired and has his own coaching institute, wrote a book called Creating Magic. Mm -hmm. And this book, it I've read it so many times, and it just talks about having constantly having the perspective from the guest, whatever whoever your customer is. From a a church, it would be somebody who's visiting or coming to be a part of your congregation. Of course, in a business, we understand somebody who comes through the doors and meeting the guests where they are with an exceptional guest service. And that's a very generalized uh, statement of a a much deeper conversation within the book. I highly recommend it. Um, Yeah, uh, Creating Magic, Lee Cockrell. It's a great, a great book. And then I have from a spiritual perspective, several of the Henry Nouwen books and just the depth of making sure we're grounded personally in our spiritual life. Again, because when you face the chaos of life or you're propelled to a platform or you experience success or failure in business, it's so critical that we remain in that grounded place spiritually. And so I love those just as to name a few that have, yeah. that have influence in business life and, and spiritual. That's good. In terms of the journey that God's brought you on, and again, yeah, so I'm trying to hit this from different angles. I'm just curious. I just want to pick at your story and just find out more different aspects of it. But I'm curious, what would you say? Because one of the things, you know this, like with business owners, I'll just say my story. Like I wanted to start a business for years And I didn't even know what kind of business I wanted to start. I just knew I wanted to start a business. And I had a, for many years, I would say crippling fear of starting a business. And because I had heard a couple of random stats or because I was afraid of tax forms. I don't know what to do. And how do I know what to do? Blah blah, blah. Like just annoying things like that would paralyze me for years. And but anyway, all this to say, what would you say, what role has risk played in in your success in certain areas of your life and particularly just yeah applying that to yeah whatever you were doing what's unique about my wiring and i totally understand your perspective kelly my wife has very much that risk adverse and i've contributed to it in some ways uh, push pushing her to step out beyond her yeah. comfort level and and all of that because i'm the polar opposite yeah. I find, and I think it comes from my upbringing, I find a comfort in that constant state of risk. I've never been risk adverse. Hmm. And in, in places, it's been, I have the full confidence and peace that has been from God, that this is a, a clarion call. This is a clear message, uh, a great example of that. So I, I had committed my life to Christ like seven or eight years old at a church camp, but I had been sent away to church camp and came back to our church and no one knew I'd made any decision there. And so I didn't really commit my life to him until later at 15. But, but my calling was very unique. People say, oh, you're going to be a pastor or you're going to lead worship or do youth or whatever all those things are. But I never felt like that was my lane. My lane was always to help support people who serve in churches. Mm -hmm. And so that's that entrepreneur. That's the difference of the risk, taking the risk or whatever, because it's not typical. It's not what people recognize. Most people don't understand it. The same with business, particularly like our concept was brand new to the market. And it was a constant education for people from day one to the last day. For 10 years, we had to tell what we did (laughs) because no one understood it because there was nothing else like it in the market. And of course, now there's been some development and some other things since then, but people didn't understand it. And that was risky. Like telling that story over and over again, you have to constantly be educating your audience and bringing on new customers. You can't depend Mm -hmm. on your customer base to, to solely sustain you. And I think I find a comfort in the place of risk. And I'm always the one who is willing to, to step out, even if it feels shaky. There's a story in the book I tell about where it was snowing. We were on family vacation in uh, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. 
and it was snowing. So we were looking for some indoor activities. And so were thousands of other people that were looking for something to do indoors. And so we went to the, what's the place called Wonderworks and they have a ropes course inside Wonderworks. And I'm looking at this thing like, this is cool. looks fun. There's a big line, but I had no idea. I'd never been on one, what it would feel like to be at the top. It ended up scaring me to death. Like <laughs> I was all shaky kneed and you're tied to this thing and you have to pull the rope along. And I, I was just all two pieces. And I remember the place where you went from the platform to the first step is about a six inch block. And it was between ropes. And I've got our two girls are between us behind us on the track. And then Kelly is rounding out our family. And I'm looking back at them and they're just like, we've never seen you like this. We, we've never seen you nervous about the risk. And I was visibly nervous about it. So Kelly from behind, it's okay if you want to turn around. And I'm looking, there's 20 people that would have to go back down the track. And I said, no way. I'm not, this is embarrassing. There's people from the ground saying, you can do it. The whole thing. And it's a whole scene. But anyway, I ended up taking the step, although it took a long time, out onto the block. And I remember looking back at my girls like, this is the daddy we know. And then I took the next step. I helped uh, our older daughter over, helped our younger daughter over, and then Kelly. And then we're all on blocks, the little blocks between the ropes. And it's it sways and it moves if you've never been on one. And I'm thinking this is a victory for us. It took a risk, uh, but it's a victory for us. Uh -huh. And there was such deep messaging in that too. And we ended up going all across the whole thing, climbing to the tops of the rope ropes course. And it looked really cool up there and they had some glow in the dark stuff. And I just thought to myself the whole time, what would we have missed if we wouldn't have taken the risk? Yeah. And that's an illustration for stepping out. That's what it feels like starting something new, particularly if you're trying to disrupt a market with something that's never been done before. Mm -hmm. I always think about what will be missed if I'm not willing to take the risk especially if I'm certain. And there's been times that I felt certain that this was a call for me. Yeah. And I look back now and think, what would I have missed? If another illustration, I don't mean to, to bore you with illustrations, but no, keep going. Uh, when Kelly and I were dating, she was getting the idea about this risk to love piece. And she always had this hesitancy and a little bit of guardedness with opening up and letting people in at a certain level. And her dad passed away when she was in fifth grade. And we discovered through that process and a lot of prayer and seeking the right counsel, et cetera, that's what contributed to that hesitancy. But one time we were home from college, just visiting, we're both from the same hometown. And she took me over to her dad's grave. And she said she remembered standing there the day that they buried him. And she said, I will... I won't ever love again because I don't want to feel this pain again. Mm. But then she looked at me, tears flowing down her face. And she said, but look, and she put her hand on my chest. She said, look at what I would have missed if I wouldn't have opened myself back up to love again. Yeah. And many of us have found ourselves relationally in business, in our churches that we miss opportunities and callings and we let it just move on by because we aren't willing to feel the pain of risk. Mm -hmm. I think it's a necessary piece of any yeah. development. <clears throat> and to me, it's a comfort. It propels me. It energizes me. The roadblocks, they give me fuel, but I understand not everybody's wired that way. Yeah. And that can be a lot of people drop off in that space. And you said about the statistics, so true. Like, very high numbers, 75% plus fail within the first five years of any new business or venture. And it's that sacred ground of the thin 20% that survive and you see it from the other side and you look back at all the risks and challenges and sacrifices that were made and you think now it's worth it, but it takes time to get there. And, and it's in that time that it's hard to maintain. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. Appreciate you sharing all that. So I'm wondering if what would, okay, let me pull this back this way. What would you, because I feel like you just have a lot that you want to share. And so if there was one message that you could 
that you wish the entire body of Christ better understood, what would that be? I think it's twofold for me. One is the message that you can do it. I think we should be commanding our place as the body of Christ back at the table, at the seat of conversation. We should be at the forefront in front of decision makers in boardrooms, yep. leading businesses in corporate world. Uh, I work now in a huge corporate setting and we should co be commanding our space back at those tables that has to me has contributed uh, to the diminishing of the domestic church is that mm -hmm. we just have allowed that. And I, I use the example all the time and it's so true. The churches used to be the center of the community. Every church was downtown main street, USA, ev everywhere you went. And for understandable reasons, we moved out from the center of, of town square so that we could have more room develop better buildings, better programs, be more accessible in a lot of cases for folks that were out in the suburbs, et cetera. But that's an illustration for what we've done within the church is we've allowed ourselves to be removed from the cultural conversation. Yeah. And we have this fine line. I don't know if other people have this, but we have two teenage girls. We're having this whole discussion right now in our house about social media because we haven't done social media. They do have phones because we like to do the Life 360 and know where they are. But we haven't done any social media and they miss out. They missed an invite for a birthday this last week. And it was because they weren't on social media. And the question we ask ourselves, is, are we okay with that? But the fine line that we balance as the church is, do we do so much so that we remove ourselves from the conversation? Remove ourselves. The new town square is social media. Are, yeah. are we willing to totally step out, be stood in a corner to now we suddenly don't have a voice? And so my encouragement is let's claw our way back. And the answer is you can do it. You, you can contribute. You don't have to be, not everything has to be the boycott, right? It can just be, let me contribute to the conversation. Let yeah. me have a piece of, at least hear me out of what I have to say on, on the subject. And you can do it. You can do it. You can influence culture. And that's the model of Christ, in my opinion, influence the culture where they are. Yep. Of course, I'm sure there was disdain for the, the culture in Jesus day in a very mm -hmm. simplistic form, but he chose to have a voice and a seat at the table and ultimately was able to reach the masses as were the disciples. Yeah. I think we should claw our way back into those decision-making spaces within our culture. Yeah. I love that. All right. I don't want to take up any more of your time, but I appreciate you coming by and sharing all this. So the book, everybody run out and check this out, Food Stamps to Franchise. Where else can people find you? Because you said you're not on social media. Where should they find you? We are. Our girls aren't. So oh, you can okay, find gotcha. me on there for sure if you search it, but or at Pastor Chris Mick across all socials. But you can find out all kinds of information, stamps to franchise.com. The book's available everywhere where books are sold. You can request it or for everybody's favorite, it's on Amazon. Just search it because there aren't many titles like that. So it'll come <laughs> in the top, top few, top few. I'll, I'll tell you a little secret. It's available early. So if you're uh, listening here on the podcast, it's available early. So skip right over there and you can link from the website to foodstampsofranchise.com. It'll take you okay. right to Amazon to order. We would love it if you'd stop by, check us out and write us on there. We'd love to pray for you. Yeah. Awesome. All right, brother. I appreciate you coming by and sharing your story and sharing some of what God's brought you through and some of the lessons learned. So thanks again. Thanks, Bob. All right. We want to know if you've heard about our flagship class called True Financial Freedom. Yeah. And if you haven't, it's more than just a money class. Mm -hmm. It's really about fulfilling your God-given purpose, breaking free from hidden money beliefs and making a lasting impact. Yeah, and we've gotten feedback from students and they've said things like, it is the first class I've taken where at the end of each session, I felt equipped and not burdened. Yeah, and it's less theory and more realistic action steps and guidance. We've also heard it felt like a conversation with friends, which is awesome. Yeah, and it encouraged me in ways I didn't think I would ever experience. This class is on demand and it's designed for churches and small groups as well as individuals. And you can get all the details at seedtime.com slash TFF.